Hi, everybody. Carl Kasgard back with you at the Halifax 57 Rescue Show. And uh, we've got some more very interesting content today on our show. And uh, we're really uh, gaining momentum here with our weekly shows. We're getting upwards of uh, over a thousand people watching, uh, you know, these uh, special adventures. It's our 30th anniversary of Halifax 57 Rescue. Uh, we're going all over the world and uh, we're saving history. Uh, Timekeepers Canada and Halifax 57 Rescue have interviewed hundreds of World War II air crew, many of them Royal Canadian Air Force that flew in combat. And um, so just to get you into the mood as the first part of our show, we'd like to show you from the horse's mouth, from the eyewitnesses that were actually there in combat, the veterans that we've recorded. Okay, here with Bud Ward, and uh, he's going to uh, give us an explanation as to how this plane operates and what the name of it is, first of all. Well, this is the Lancaster uh, bomber. It's made up in the lettering of of uh, the Moose Squadron, which is 419 of the Canadian Six Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the specific aircraft in which Andy Minarski of Winnipeg was to later win the Victoria Cross. Mm. And this is the one that you, you were in yourself? Yes, we flew in a similar aircraft. I was a rear gunner. Mm -hmm. And where, where, where's that position? This is right at the rear of the aircraft, mm -hmm. followed by your mid-upper gunner here, of course. Mm -hmm. And then in the greenhouse was the pilot and the engineer, flight engineer, dubbed as the second pilot. And behind them immediately sat the navigator, then the wireless op. Mm -hmm. And to the very front of the aircraft was the bomb aimer, who also doubled as the front gunner. Did this plane, was it equipped with any uh, special uh, escape uh, hatches that uh, were used during the war? Or any oh yeah, well there's two methods of exit, uh, unless you're blown out of course. And that was the escape hatch to the front of the aircraft on mm -hmm. which the bomb aimer laid during bombing runs. Okay. And then there was the main door on the starboard side where, time permitting, the main parties went out. Right, and uh, with parachutes? Yeah. Okay, and uh, there's several engines, there's... Uh... Oh yes, these were all uh, four-engine bombers and uh, Rolls-Royce, probably the best engine built in the world. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, were there any, um, uh, was there any way that fires could be put out on the engines once started? Mm, I'm no engineer, but it's been known to have fires put out at all, yes, yeah. but uh, it's don't... Like a sprinkler system or something like that? They do have a sprinkler system, right? Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the severity of the fire, whether or not your gas tanks have been holed and set aflame, then it's hopeless. Right, of course. And uh, just out of curiosity, you uh, were shot down in a, in a model similar to this. So, yes. And uh, how, how, was, how did that happen? Well, we were the first all Lancaster uh, raid to Berlin on September 3rd, mm -hmm. 1943. Mm -hmm. I believe we were 640 strong. And this was the third trip of Bomber Harris's onslaught to Berlin, mm -hmm. now called the Battle of Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was dense cloud cover the whole way that night. and. Uh, the skipper had no sooner said, uh, how far are we from the target, uh, Norm, that was our navigator, mm -hmm. and he said we should be there any minute. And boom, just like that, we flew out of the clouds right into the searchlights who were playing on the leading edge of the storm front. Mm. It was crystal clear over the target, and we were immediately nailed by, I would suggest, 50 to 60 searchlights. Mm. And once in searchlights, as a rule, that's it, uh, they're, they're called silent death. Mm. And uh, this was about the fifth raid where once a plane was coned, uh, the flak guns, the high flak guns shut down mm -hmm. and you were left to the mercy of the night fighters. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Ju-88 came in from starboard high mm -hmm. and gave us a real go and knocked uh, both outer engines. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the plane went down out of control and the order was given to bail out. Mm -hmm. The uh, force was so great I could barely get out of the rear turret but I couldn't locate my parachute mm -hmm. and as it transpires I suddenly realized the plane's flying level again. I checked in at an intercom station near the tail and I was told everything was Jake Lou, uh, we're heading home. Unfortunately, the bomb aimer had already parachuted over Berlin. Mm. So the rest of us continued on the leg home that night and we were violating Swedish neutrality. Mm. And with the 10 tenths cloud cover, we couldn't see ground. So thinking we were over Sweden, the bailout order came and it transpires the wireless air gunner and myself and the flight engineer landed on Zeeland, which is the main island of Denmark, mm -hmm. all north of Copenhagen. And the navigator, mid-upper gunner and skipper bailed out in the, the Kattegat. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, myself and the wireless operator were, were captured then and there. Our flight engineer escaped back with the Danish underground to, uh, through Sweden back to England. Mm. Our navigator, who used to be a lifeguard in Australia, surprisingly drowned in the Kattegat. We assume his parachute uh, Must have gone. harness got all uh, squeegeed around him. Mm. And the pilot and mid upper gunner were rescued by the Swedish Navy and I think it was in eight days they were flown back to England. However, back in England, the skipper returned to operations after uh, special leave, whereby his first trip back was again to Berlin. And uh, returning to England, it was the worst fog in Bomber Command history. Mm -hmm. And they lost a whole slew of bombers over England because they were unable to land. And unfortunately, he and his new crew slammed into the ammunition dump mm. at our squadron. And that was the, the tale of our shoot down, as you might say. Mm -hmm. So we spent the rest of the war in Germany in prison camp in the Eastern Zone, mm -hmm. and we were liberated by the Russian army in late April 43, mm -hmm. or 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's seven of you, seven. Seven in the crew, yeah, right. right. Can fit in, in this aircraft. Oh. It was a wonderful airplane. Very secure, I would imagine, would have to be to be shot at. Right. Was it, uh, it wasn't bulletproof? Oh, heavens no. No. Nothing in life's bulletproof. No. Well, that's very interesting. Is there anything else about the, the, the aircraft that stands out in your memory? That, uh... Only that there's so darn few left. There's only two flying in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, one's in Hamilton, the Minarski uh, Memorial, Lancaster and the city of Lincoln in England, which is in the Queen's area flight. Where, where did the plane originate? Do you know? Oh, it's British built and designed, but they did build uh, slightly in excess of 700 in Canada. Mm. And I think during the war there were 7,000 plus built. Mm. Welcome back folks and uh, to the Halifax 57 rescue show. And as we proceed through our into our 31st year in existence, we wanted to continue on with the long two-year adventure to recover Halifax NA-337 from the deep lake uh, in Norway, Lake Miosa. And we had to gather all the information we could on the Halifax, its history, its manufacture, its structure, in order to do the best we could for recovering Halifaxes. So let's show you that now. And uh, you'll be able to see that the Halifax was no ordinary aircraft. After investigating a series of World War II flight records, the two Norwegian historians were able to locate an eyewitness to the actual force landing. From Canada to Yorkshire, England, Jeff and Carl meet with Thomas Waitman, tail gunner and the lone survivor of Halifax NA-337. Well, we were on a mission to drop the supplies into the resistance, you see. And uh, 
everything went all right, you know, we got our, our supplies. And on the way back, I think we got a bit too low, and we, uh, or maybe a bit off course, and we were heading for a bridge, which was guarded, sort of day and night and everything. Yeah, apparently it was a, a very, uh, I think it was a railway bridge or something, you know, which they guarded. The only sort of connection between the north and the south or something like that. And uh, so they opened up on us, you know, with anti uh, and the air cab guns. And they hit us, and uh, I think there was an engine went on fire, and one or two other things, I think. Mm -hmm. And we went on a little bit further, and uh, so we were ditched on the lake, and of course I was knocked unconscious. And I said, uh, I expect that's what happened to the engineer as well. I always said that in Halifax, you know, the main wings you know, go through the, uh, through mm -hmm. the, uh, the fuselage. Mm -hmm. And where you sat in your ditching position, you know, hands behind your head, yes. but the uh, the wing spar was right on your neck. Mm. And I, I always said, you know, if, any, if you hit the down any hard, you would knock yourself out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think no, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Because when I awoke, I was under the water, you see, and uh, I couldn't hear anything, you see. So I managed to get out. As I say, I got annoyed, you know, uh, with the, uh, yeah. you know, with the media and whatnot. Uh, you know, people think that only the Lancaster and the Spitfire and I took part in the war. You know, exactly, did. exactly, one hundred percent. That's what annoys me. Hey, you're right. Tell of the Halifax, you know, really, that you know. But the first tell of the Lancaster and the Spitfire. I mean, there's dozens of others. Yes, great for sure. Yeah, of course. Well. The, the, the reason we wanted to get you here was because I talked to Rolf and I talked to Tor. Yeah. And I went over there several times. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And how do I put this? When I talked to Rolf and Tor, they felt very strongly about that they wanted this aircraft to be a memorial. They did, yes. You know, yes. they wanted yes. to bring it up yes. and make it yes. into a memorial. Yes. Yes. And I want to ask you how you feel about that. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, you know. Do you think it could, if it could get salvaged, do you think it would make a good memorial? Oh, quite, yes. I can imagine that, yes. Okay. yes. After the meeting with Thomas Waitman, the team traveled to the Air Museum at Yorkshire. There, a Halifax bomber was being rebuilt from scratch by using various sections from a number of planes. The expert advice and knowledge gained from meeting these British restoration professionals was invaluable to the Canadians. As the memories returned for Jeff, Thomas and the others, there was a definite spark of inspiration in their eyes. These men were about to embark on one of the most challenging adventures of their lives. The aircraft at the bottom of Lake Miosa was no longer just an airplane. It was something that would capture an intricate moment in time for all future generations to see. To retrieve Halifax NA-337, it was going to be a real challenge, and they knew it. Well, we hope you enjoyed that, and uh, we're going to continue on and on as we get further and further along on the great recovery of Halifax NA-337. And uh, uh, just to inform you for the next show, we're going to have uh, a veteran, Tony Little, uh, a rear gunner of a Halifax bomber. Uh, and he was uh, unfortunately or luckily shot down and prisoner of war right at the end of the war. We're gonna have all of his uh, testimony. Uh, but also, we need you to understand now that you know just how much work we're doing and the expenses we are incurring, please support us, share our story, like our story, help us to build up the support we need to keep going. This Halifax bomber is so important in World War II and Bomber Command and to all Canadians. And so please uh, support us and we will see you next week with more adventures on the Halifax 57 Rescue Show. Thanks a lot and bye-bye for now.